All right, I said we're going to do things a little bit looser here, and uh, we really got loosened up by Lenny Dykstra last week, and we're going to continue with that, probably not as crudely uh, or any of those things, but, I, I, you know, I just think it's fun to do things that are a little outside the political area, especially when they're in the neighborhood where we are here in the shark coast of Florida, or as we talk about it, as we call it. And uh, with me is Harry Smith who is a karaoke jockey, and it's a special occasion this week because he's been doing this for a while, and um, he's about to have his 5,000th show tomorrow in Flagler Beach at uh, Finn's, and I thought it would be fun to talk to him because I've talked to him some, and uh, let me bring him on. Harry, what's going on? Hey, Adam. How are you? Congrats on the big milestone tomorrow night. Thank you very much, sir. Let's hear about how you started in karaoke, a little bit about your background and how you got into this. Absolutely. Deal. I've got a background pretty heavy into sales and business management, and uh, I was in a, a dead-end job where I was selling flowers. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, I was a flower wholesaler, and it was getting harder and harder for me to earn money. I was spending a lot more time working and earning less money, and I was kind of looking for a way out. And as a diversion to go out and have a little fun, we started going out and singing karaoke mm -hmm. and uh made friends with the guy who whose show we were visiting pretty regularly and he had a tragedy happen in his life and during one of his shows I had gone over to him and said, you know, hey, we come to a lot of your shows if you ever need somebody to fill in for you, I'd be happy to do it at no charge just to help you out. Don't feel like you need to be here at work if you need to be at home. Oh, wow. And uh, he he thought that was pretty cool and my friends thought that was really cool and they said, you know, you're kind of cut out for this kind of work. You should consider going into it. So I so took their advice to heart. Yeah, I, I took their advice to heart, and I started looking into what it would cost to go into the business, and it didn't make sense to me at all. It seemed very cost prohibitive, and I didn't mm -hmm. understand how to earn money doing it. Uh, so uh, I said, no. I, I called my buddy. I said, no, it doesn't look like I'm going to be going into the business. I'm just going to keep going into the direction I'm going. And I hung up the phone with him, and I picked up the newspaper, and in that very edition of the newspaper, there was an ad in there that said, karaoke show available for the right person. Huh. Uh, jobs possibly included, contact so-and-so, and gave them a call. And uh, this was in uh, April of 1999. And karaoke and was still I, relatively new then, right? Absolutely. Well, it wasn't new, but it wasn't as uh, heavy as it is. Uh, it wasn't as saturated. Uh, it was still kind of a, a young thing. It, it actually started getting big in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, then... Uh, I told the girl that had the show for sale, I said, you know, I sell flowers for a living. If you can get me through Mother's Day, I'll pay you your asking price. I won't even ask you to take less money if you'd be willing to hold the show for me and not sell it to anyone else. And that worked out perfectly. I got through Mother's Day. I had a big wad of cash in my pocket. I gave her everything she wanted. And a friend of mine happened to live across the street from her, so I did a birthday party for them. And that was the very first show I did in May of 1999. And uh, once I loaded everything into my trailer and gave them the money, I've been a karaoke guy full-time ever since. <laughs> so you went from nothing to full-time karaoke. Did it take you a while to get a following? Or, I mean, and what's Absolutely. your musical background, by the way? I mean, I know you can sing because you've done backup for me when I've gone out around here. And this was all in northeast South, central Florida, right? Thank you. Yeah, I've got a, a limited musical background, uh, nothing of any formality whatsoever, no formal training and no formal experience. Uh, I was spending time in 1997 to 1998 or so with a fellow in uh, Orlando where I was uh, experimenting a little with music. We were playing music on the weekends and recording some things and toying with the idea of maybe putting together a band or some sort of an act mm -hmm. to play out around Orlando. And it didn't really work out because alcohol being what it is, uh, it was hard to get everybody on the same page uh, where mm -hmm. nobody was too drunk to get up and uh -huh. perform. And Yeah, so then I, when I discovered karaoke uh, in 98 or so, I said, you know, the karaoke machine would never get drunk. Right. <laughs> so that kind of them. started looking like a better alternative. And uh, you never did, and played any musical instruments? You just sang a little bit before? Exactly. Yeah, just a little bit of singing background that way. And back when I was in elementary school, I'd gone to summer camp and discovered that I could sing there, but never did anything with it at all in high school. Okay. So I think we have a little bit about your background there. Now, here are the questions. Which are the songs that make you cringe the most? <laughs> I mean, the first second oh, of my premiere, Don't Stop Believing, because no one can sing like Steve Perry, first of all. And then just picture is so played out when there's so many other duets out there. Yes. 
There are all I'd say all of the ones that are considered overplayed definitely make you cringe. The rest of it would be very subjective, uh depending on taste. Uh which are know, the you, most overplayed? Mm. Depending on the age group, um uh, mm-hmm. it's changing a little bit. I'd say turn the page Bob Seeger, oh, really? uh Crazy by Patsy Cline. Mm-hmm. Um Picture, as you said, Don't Stop Believing. Um Oh, there's just so I'm hearing many a lot of that one, right. like, I've got a girl crush. I hear it at another bar. I, I yep, things that's that, a new one. It's not so much played out yet, but it, it could get there. That's, that's a candidate for the new. next one. Yeah. yeah. What What are the best ones in terms of getting the crowd going? If you want, to, I mean, you know me by now. Not a great singer, but I definitely do song selection in there that if the crowd is just dying to have a dance song, yet you have people singing faithfully by journey, time, or songs like that where you can't really get into it. I just try to get exactly. it more fun. But like, what are the best of all? The like, two the best. best ways to nail a crowd that way are either, like you say, to choose the correct song for the for the room. When you're realizing that the room is dying, and you can bring it up with your song selection, right. that's always a really good thing, regardless of your talent. Because even if you're not talented, if you're trying and you pick the right song, you can sell it to the crowd with no mm-hmm. problem whatsoever. Uh, the people who don't know how to read a crowd and uh, are in a room full of people and completely miss it with their song choice, always fail miserably. Um, They might even do technically a really great job of their song, but if you're singing uh, Nine Inch Nails songs to uh, a 60 and up crowd, you're probably going to lose them on that one regardless of how good you do it. Trent Reznor might be pushing close to 60. (laughs) Now, your website is harryoki.com, and I'm not like signing off here. I just want to tell people to look at it. H a r r y o k e. I don't know how useful it'll be if someone's listening in Seattle right now, but if you're anywhere near Central or Northeast Florida, worth coming out. Um, you have a really what, before I had even met you a couple weeks ago, uh, I was so impressed by seeing your website, which is really well done, but just the extensive rules section that you have there. And I've never seen anything like that, and you really explain the whole process. So maybe you could take borrow from that a little bit. Well, I guess it's not borrowing if you wrote it, but uh, <laughs> explain like the basics of karaoke, how to have a good time, everything people need to know who haven't tried it before. Absolutely, it's it's a phenomenon that people are either wired for it or they're not. Um, there's a, a great handful of people that come out to places and realize that they're in the middle of a karaoke show and they have a really great time just watching everybody. Mm-hmm. And admittedly, there are people that will walk into a karaoke show and be just completely repulsed by it. Yeah. These people can't sing. What are we doing here? We're burning our ears out. And it's not for everybody. But for the most part, a good and well-run karaoke show can win over the casual person. But who my target is are people who love that lifestyle. If you're a person who's inclined to like to go to a karaoke show or sing at a karaoke show, then I'm the guy that they need to be searching out. And when I created my rules and my policies, they're designed on two levels. Uh, When I initially started, I do everything in my business, and, and this is a golden rule for any business, I do everything in my business to please myself as a customer. Mm -hmm. So if I have any question at all on how to handle a policy or how to handle a situation, I ask myself, if I were the customer, would I be okay with this or would this turn me off? And if it turns me off, you don't do it. If you're going to be pleased, then you're probably doing the right thing. Then if you can communicate that in writing for your customers to understand what your policies are Mm -hmm. and be consistent with those policies, that's just the golden rule of doing any kind of business at all. Mm-hmm. It's and born of years of experience as well after seeing what the problems are. When, when you face the same problem 20 times, you realize you need to address it with a policy and, and, and communicate of, it to your customers. Speaking of problems, we missed a few words there. But And you have an <laughs> intro. You really get into it. I, I noticed you have a lot about the bartenders and servers and just where you should sit and all that that people just might not realize uh, when they go to a karaoke show because people – by definition, aren't going to the bar necessarily to drink. They might while they're there, but you have a lot of people, and it probably there is some economics involved from the bar's standpoint. Or the rest Absolutely, the and that particularly came to light during the recession a few years back. Uh-huh. Uh, there's an essay on there that I actually wrote during the recession for that reason because mm-hmm. – uh, I'll tell you, it was kind of a bulletproof business to be in during the recession because uh, the money kept coming in because people were still going to bars uh, even 
when their money was tight. But we did experience a lot of problems with people who didn't understand how karaoke shows generate money. Mm -hmm. And they would come out and think they were being supportive by singing a song, but they weren't buying a drink or they were drinking water and not tipping. Right. And when you make it abundantly clear that, you know, yes, if you're going to drink water, take really good care of your server and they won't care. Uh, mm -hmm. Or, you know, if you're going to come out with just enough money to buy your food and not tip your server, don't bother coming out. We, you know, I, my mantra has always been no business is better than bad business. And mm -hmm. if you're working all night and losing money, there's no sense in working. And that's kind of the, the mantra for karaoke economically. Right. And uh, now you, Saturday nights and Friday nights, you don't do it at a bar, right? You uh, you do private shows, and uh, that's a totally different situation, I imagine. How's that work? Fridays, I'm in a bar. I try to keep oh, my Saturdays right. open because that's when the uh, majority of pr uh, private parties are. But um, you can do really better in the private sector uh, earnings-wise because uh, it's a different contract and the jobs mm -hmm. aren't as regular. It's it's like the difference between uh, doing something for somebody one time where you have to do a setup for them as opposed to if they ask you to do it every week uh, mm -hmm. where it's more of a contract thing. You just kind of show up and do your thing. So I keep must, myself open for that. Yeah, in uh, in big cities up north, you can definitely do well in the month of December in particular, I imagine. Absolutely. And there's some people that do what I do for a living that absolutely do not do any bar work at all. They stick strictly to the, uh, to the private party uh, sector, and they try to charge enough so that they generally have full-time jobs and do this part-time, uh -huh. whereas I'm kind of the – the tortoise that's running the long, slow race, I'll take the lower bar money and I'll take it really often. And I'll, I'll tell, like, my neighbors see me pulling out with my van all the time and I say, well, I don't make a lot of money, but I make a little bit of money really often. <laughs> Any final thoughts about uh, your 5,000 shows and your, I guess, 18 years of doing karaoke? Yeah, 18 going into the 19th year as of Mother's Day, of course. Uh, it's It's been a really long, strange trip, but I will tell you, uh, the stories, I wish I had kept a journal the whole time because uh -huh. I've forgotten things weirder than a lot of people have actually experienced. Uh, the characters you meet, good and bad. I've seen the best in people, the worst in people. I've brought people together. I became an ordained minister so that I could marry my customers when oh, they wow. meet and hook up. Uh, and then I've, you know, I've seen people go to jail for really horrendous things and, hmm. you know, everything you can imagine in the nightlife, the good and the bad, I've seen it all. And, uh, the stories are there to tell and it's just a really kind of a interesting, great way to make a living. You know what? You did mention something there. It is a good place for guys to meet girls. It really is. I don't think a lot oh, of them yeah. realize it. I mean, they don't realize, you know, you don't have to have scintillating conversation necessarily. If you're singing, dancing, hey, you want to join me? You don't have to think of lines, all that. It, the old Eddie Murphy skit tonight. comes to mind. He Which used to talk what? about uh, how the singers always get the girls, and uh, uh -huh. it's absolutely true. If you can get onto a karaoke stage in front of a bunch of strangers, you could go to any town in the country, and if you can get on a karaoke stage and try, exhibit some effort, and win the crowd over, as soon as right. you sit down to go back to your beer, you're going to have people coming over to you and talking to you, and that includes the opposite sex as well. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And people buy you drinks and stuff too, which is fun if you have. A it's just the greatest so social platform just for going out and meeting people of, of a like mind. It really is. All right, Harry Smith, Harryoki dot com. Congratulations on five thousand uh, shows, or as of tomorrow night. And uh, I'll probably see you later tonight. You're in Ormond. Fantastic, Adam. I'm looking forward to it. And thank All you right. for the opportunity to talk to you today. Pleasure talking to you.